perfecto, mucho. I'll give you later, okay? Yeah. We have to start right now. No problem. You can send it to my email also. Okay. Muy buenos días a todos. Eh, muchas gracias por asistir. Bienvenidos a la sexta sesión de este curso de nanotecnología para la administración de fármacos herbales eh, a cargo de nuestro invitado, el profesor, el especialista Fulbright, profesor eh, Jan Guampata. Entonces, pues vamos a comenzar en un segundo. So, Professor Jaswan, welcome again. Thank you very much. We are all set to start your lecture today. I have a problem here. Sorry. Good. Buenos dias and today is our lecture 6 of the workshop uh, which is on recent trends in nano delivery of SIRNA to the eye. All the figures are taken to explain the concept and appropriate reference is given for the only and it is only for educational purposes and not for commercial purposes so kindly use it for your own educational purposes. Uh, so. Buenos días, good morning, Amo Colombia, y la gente de Acqui, Acqui, mi nombre es Yeshwan Patak, actualmente estoy en USA. soy profesor y decano asociado en la Universidad del Sur de Florida, Taneja College of Pharmacy, estoy en Colombia como becario Fulbright Specialist. Sincere thank to Universidad Distrital Francisco Jose de Caldas for hosting me as a Fulbright Specialist here at Bogota. My sincere thanks to Rector and Dean and other administrative heads supporting my trip here. My sincere thanks to Fulbright Specialist Commission of Colombia for supporting my trip to Bogota, Colombia. I will fail if I do not mention my sincere gratitude to Professor Cesar Aurelio Heran, Hereno Fierro, uh, being my host and incredible support for my stay here, happy, stay happy here. Special thank to Reem Abdiol Lohum and Sharon Fleming of World Learning USA, Sergio Villamil Sanchez and Sebastian Villamizar and many others from Colombian Fulbright Commission for their kind support. Professor Luis H. Reyes, Reyes Juan C. Cruz and Willie Moreno, Luis Fernando Cruz Quirogo. Special thank to Professor Alexis Ortiz from International Office of UDFJDC and Alvaro Vasquez for who encouraged me to apply for this Fulbright Specialist Fellowship for Colombia. Encouragement of all is so supportive. Outcome is I am here. Desde el fondo de mi corazón. So apologies for my Spanish pronunciation and if you understand my Spanish then surely you will understand my English. Miss disculpas for me espanol. So today we are going to talk about the SIRNA delivery to the eye. Uh, this is a very interesting area which is developing in last 10-15 years and people are trying to learn more and more about this and it appears that it has been very successful gene delivery they call it in certain cancers and now they are exploring whether it can be applicable to cardiovascular setup ophthalmology and all different types of area so what learning objective we have today 
is understanding the eye related diseases challenges which are faced in treating the eye diseases discussing the new strategies to treat eye diseases using si rna recent trends in si rna nano drug delivery and conclusions and future trends in this area so we are focusing today exclusively on ophthalmic drug delivery and application of gene therapy for ophthalmic drug delivery we are not venturing in other area but we will focus it on this one so what is the ophthalmic drug delivery world health organization facts and figures for eye problems this is very important data so you will find that uh, estimated 253 million people live with vision impairment in the world and 36 million are blind 217 million have moderate to severe vision impairment and 81% of the people who are blind or have moderate or severe vision impairment are aged 50 years and above so majority of some of the challenges are for the senior citizen those who are living longer globally the chronic eye diseases are the main cause of vision loss uncorrected refractive errors and then an unoperated cataract are the top causes of vision impairment an operated cataract remains the leading cause of blindness in low and middle income countries so you will find that people as you age you start suffering from cataract and then the cataract grows in your eye and if you do not remove the cataract when it matures then it covers your whole eyesight and lead to blindness yeah. and this is happening especially in a rural area where there are no accessibility to the healthcare and that's why millions of people suffer or become blind because of this simple thing it can be removed immediately and you can see but the facilities are not available and people do not have adequate money there are many many ophthalmologists all over the world in many countries who do free cataract surgeries and it doesn't take it only take 15 to 20 minutes to do the cataract surgery but if you do it at the right time you are not blind if you don't do it at the right time you become blind and that is where but this is a very specialized surgery because we have to open the eye and then remove the cataract it is not easy to be done but not for every ophthalmologist you have to be trained to do the cataract surgeries and people do cataract surgeries in the tents in many countries they, they, there is no need for a sterile environment and good operation theater it can be done very quickly and that is why a uh, good number of people like i have a friend who is the head of the department of ophthalmology in our university he conducts such camps and he goes many places to do the camps and then he just in the tents he continuously removes the cataracts in like 15 minutes one after the other and he does help 100 patients a day more or less very quick uh, and he is very good at that so he needs some support if you have a good nurse working with you then you remove the cataract the nurse closes the eye and you are all set because and that works they they have a team work to do that and it is working very well so they are now trying to find out how this access can be given to people around the world so that there will be reduction in the blind people because of cataract the prevalence of infectious eye diseases such as trachoma or uh, onchocerasis sera onchocerasis have reduced significantly over the last 25 years and over 80% of the all vision impairment can be prevented or cured now this is a preventable uh, thing but you need to uh, take a care of that so according to the recent estimate the major global cause of moderate to severe impairment are uncorrected refractive errors what happens is in children and nowadays you must have seen it is a impact of the iphone and tv that children at a very young age have started using these screens and when they see the screen they do like this and that affect their eyesight and there are so many little children 3 years old 4 years old 5 years old they are wearing glasses now and because of the continuous watch of tv or your iphone and all those things so now if you if the child doesn't explain the parents that i don't see then it continues and it is uncorrected refractive error 
and over the period of time you just the children start getting high how are you children start getting uh, challenges and then the number of the glass become bigger and bigger and then the glass become thicker and thicker and that is where you start creating problem for the children and hence it is the job of the parents especially for the younger children that keep on testing them if they are continuously using these gadgets then they must check their children's eyesight and if they check the children's eyesight then it will definitely be helpful to them so that is uncorrected refractive errors and that leads to blindness actually so we have to that is preventable then there is a unoperated cataract which is almost 25% as i mentioned that if you have a cataract and if you don't operate it then it lead to blindness then there is a another major challenge which is called as age related macular degeneration so age related macular degeneration is your central eyesight is lost over the period of time and i'll show you here is the picture of this i don't know if i can play this video or not here yeah. but it's a, you can let me can i play this video is it possible so i just to cut and paste on youtube because it gives a very good idea about um no we just have to copy and paste probably on the youtube we have to remove the okay and then go to uh, oh that's great yeah yeah but i have to i, hope I have to make a change yeah sorry you can press here yeah. it will be placed yeah yeah so uh, mm -hmm. for day to see i have to uh, no, put, the... put it in the in the, okay, the yeah. screen so give me a second don't read the letter <laughs> no 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 they are not seeing you right don't worry <laughs> okay i'm just joking están viendo eh, la pantalla yes sí 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 <clears throat> Okay. Uh, so no. age related macular degeneration or AMD is the leading cause of visual impairment and blindness in older Americans. It affects the retina, the light sensitive layer of the eye. In early AMD, yellowish deposits form under the retina. They can result in distortion and gradual blurring no, of perdón, vision. Perdón. As the disease progresses, more and larger deposits develop, and blood vessels grow up from beneath the retina and leak blood. The leaked blood causes damage to the retina. In advanced AMD, peripheral vision may remain, but the ability to clearly see straight ahead is lost. Hola. Okay. We have to go back. Eh, pudieron escuchar? No. Okay. We just have to put it on the YouTube, no? It doesn't. Yeah, work. I can send the link. Yeah, I'm going to send the link for to, to you YouTube to, to see it later to watch the video later. So, so um, okay, later on. Okay, <laughs> no problem. <laughs> So you can go ahead. Gracias. No problem. Mm -hmm. I'm from W. <laughs> 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 so it's a very beautiful video on macular degeneration. I will recommend you to go on YouTube. Just type macular degeneration and you will understand. What happens is your posterior eye, we have we call it two types of sections of the eye one is called this is called anterior eye which you see and then the anything which is behind the screen is called posterior eye and in the posterior eye there are a lot of uh, red blood uh, the um, arteries very fine arteries 
now what happens is over the period of time as you are aging the pressure in the eye grows and the pressure when it grows it expands the arteries and when the artery expands part of the blood oozes out and part of the blood oozes out and you can see here the blockade correct and that oozes out get coagulated once it coagulated it forms a black spot and over the period of time the spot becomes bigger and bigger and once it becomes bigger and bigger your central vision is lost and if i am seeing i will say i see professor caesar i see this young gentleman but i don't see you because my central vision doesn't work and that is called macular degeneration suppose your peripheral vision doesn't work that i will not see professor caesar i will not see our young brother but i will see three of you that means my peripheral vision is not working that is called glaucoma yeah, yeah. so these are the two things and then if that remains there and becomes a block then that is cataract it becomes a solid block so cataract glaucoma and macular degen glaucoma and macular degeneration are mostly aging process and people who immunogenicity immune, immune uh, re reaction are compromised like in covid we have compromised immune reactions our immunity was reduced so in aging process over the period of time your immunity reduces so you start getting different kinds of diseases which are inflammatory normally so glaucoma is a if your immunity is compromised then you are liable to become suffering from glaucoma for example in india i don't know here have you heard the name called chikungunya chikungunya you have heard it it is here you had chikungunya here so people who had chikungunya they have compromised immunity and compromised immunity leads to glaucoma means i i have a personal my wife is uh, suffering from she had a chikungunya when she was in india because of the mosquito bites and then when she came back to america she couldn't even lift teapot it was very weak and then she suffered from glaucoma because of the after effects of chikungunya now people are suffering nowadays we are learning about the after effects of covid we don't know yet completely but in coming period uh, few years we will be able to know those who have suffered from covid may have some long term challenges because their immunity is compromised so glaucoma is one of the reason for immunity compromised patients and macular degeneration is almost because of the age because the pressure so if you go to ophthalmologist nowadays there are technologies where they will touch uh, your posterior eye and understand what is the pressure and if the pressure is high then they put some medicine to reduce the pressure because higher the pressure arteries may yeah. break mm -hmm. and then the blood will come out ooze out and they coagulate so this is where the challenge is and that is uh, macular degeneration glaucoma is 2% diabetic retinopathy is another challenge that if you have a high sugar level then gradually your retina become stiff and it stops working properly and then you suffer from diabetes but it is 1% major clauses of blindness are unoperated cataract uncorrected refractive errors and glaucoma so who is at risk now there are two groups which are at risk one is 50 and above and children below 15 children below 15 are subjected uh, they are uh, at risk because they don't know the little children don't know exactly whether they are seeing is correct or wrong or right and the parents don't understand sometimes it is very tough because i remember when i was a young child i was very bad child naughty child so my parents never believed me what i say so i used to tell that i cannot see on the blackboard my father used to say that you are cheating then the doctor told my father he is a naughty boy he doesn't so when after one one and a half years i was telling that i cannot see on the blackboard so my father took me to the ophthalmologist who is his friend and he tested my eye and my first glasses were 2.5 number if they would have tested me 
year before or two years before it would have been 0.5 and I would have lost the classes. But by the time it was a reflective, you know, it didn't properly done. So uh, it is nice to look at the children to find out whether they see or not. And you have to be careful about, uh, especially those who are using a lot of TV. They, they, you have a question? It is recorded, no? Yeah. Or oh, there are people on... Oh, okay. so they were all waiting for to be admitted. Okay, so people who are aged above 50, uh, more of the 65% of the people who are visually impaired are age 50 and older. And this age group comprises of 20% of the world population. It's a big group. And what happens is by the time you reach 50, you stop thinking about your health. You know, it is very common that if your children are growing, you don't care for your health. You think that, oh, okay, let me put priority family. And that's how people ignore a lot of their health challenges. And that's how 50 and above people uh, have challenges and with increasingly elderly population in many countries, many people are risk at risk with the age-related visual impairment. So as the older group is growing, now what happens if you have a 70 years old like me at your home? My children don't care. They say, hey, old man, you know, anyway, he's going to die. <laughs> So, it is also is a very interesting thing that that is happening. Ignorance also is uh, another challenge. And then children below age 15, estimated 19 million children are visually impaired. And now the number is growing significantly. Of these 12 million children are visually impaired due to refractive errors and a condition that could be easily diagnosed and corrected. They, if they put the glasses, they can be corrected. But if you don't put it at right time, then you lose and you steadily uh, grow in number in your glasses and 1.4 million are irreversibly blind for the rest of their life because of the negligence and that can be prevented and this is where uh, another interesting challenge is there. So this is a typical picture of the eye. So you will find that this is posterior eye from what you see from uh, uh, anterior eye, what you see from the front side and this is all the thing which is behind is a posterior eye. And this posterior eye has got different types of portions. So you will see that for anterior eye, it is eyelid, acclimal, uh, caruncle, tear duct, and then iris is there, pupil is there. So you can see those things here on the anterior eye. Uh, there is a cornea, lens is there, then anterior chamber is there, posterior chamber is there supersensory ligaments are the ciliar body muscle. So what happens is macular degeneration and glaucoma happens in this area. That's where the, as I shown in the previous thing. And then you have these nerves connected to your brain. This is very interesting. Now you have to understand that they always call blood brain barrier. Correct? Have you heard about blood brain barrier? So it is one of the strongest system where the material does not get into your brain because there is a barrier. Mm -hmm. But nowadays people have found out that the ophthalmic eye, posterior eye and brain barrier is much stronger than the blood brain barrier. So you don't get infection from your eye to the brain even though it is connected. But the barrier in between is very strong, stronger than the blood brain barrier. And this is where your challenges are. and. Uh, I have several, I am going to talk about that probably in one of the uh, course, uh, our workshop, uh, where we have developed the uh, drug delivery system which can be injected in this portion. 
in this portion uh, for treatment of macular degeneration and we'll discuss that in next class so optic nerve retinal blood vessel vitreous body medical rectus so these are all different parts of the posterior eye and this is where the challenges come into the picture so the common statistics for in united states here there are 36.8 million people over age 40 national eye to suffer from either uvitis conjunctivitis age related macular degeneration diabetic retinopathy glaucoma retinal vein occlusion and cytomegalovirus retinitis so these are different types of diseases which are common in the population and this is macula that is what we call it macula and then this optic nerve is there which goes to the brain as you know that your eyes see something correct as i have mentioned that you put your fingers in the fire your eyes see the fire so the eyes have nerves so this optic nerve will send the message to the brain that the hand get fire you know hand get burned so the brain will send the message to the hand pull it off from the fire so this optic nerves are very strong because 90% of the accidents we can avoid if we see properly correct otherwise if you don't see the properly the eyes do not send the right message to the brain then you are going to jump you know like i like interesting thing in colombia i walk a lot nowadays so when i walk i have seen the pavements and lot of pavements will have holes <laughs> am i right yeah yeah or they have a steel rods going out of the pavement so if you don't walk properly there is every chance that you go down <laughs> you remember yesterday we were walking you know thank you she took me beautiful places so uh, yesterday we were walking and we just were crossing the road and there was a big hole and, uh, and there was a small passage to walk by i said hey watch what what so if your eyes are not cautious you are going to fall down in colombia does that make sense but not only colombia everywhere in the world it is common so your eyes are really protecting you and the better you have good eyes or good eyesight you are protected your body is protected if your eyesight is problematic you will suffer and this is where you need to be very cautious about so these are various diseases which are common in the uh, ophthalmic system and i now what is happening is that it is very difficult to put anything in your posterior eye because anterior eye you put eye drops as soon as you put eye drops lot of tears come out and almost 70% of your eye drops go away it is wasted because the moment you put eye drops or eye lotions or eye ointments they will immediately your body will have a immunogenic reaction and it will immediately push lot of tears out of your eyes and so so the absorption of any drug in the anterior eye is very low and in the posterior eye it is difficult to get in because of the uh, system and that is where you have to inject your drug into the posterior eye and again it is a very specialized thing we'll talk about that later sometime and we definitely know so this is our uh, anterior eye posterior eye and to get so anything from anterior eye to the posterior eye is very tough so you have different types of and now this distance for the surface area is very low it is not like your stomach big thing it is very small area in millimeters so surface area for absorption of the drug is smaller so now what is happening is people have realized that if there is a small surface area then you if your particles are smaller your absorption will be higher and that is why when the nanotechnology came into the picture people started working on posterior eye delivery using nanoparticles that is what my research work also is so this is the uh, understanding of how this um, posterior eye can be ac accessible and we can look at that so sites of drug delivery administration are topical like uitis and conjunctivitis when you have suffer from that it is topical so you keep on adding the eye drops conjunctivitis it becomes red your eyes eyes become red conjunctivitis and then you keep on and conjunctivitis can be communicable 
so you keep on adding the eye drops and 70% of the eye drops go out 30% remain so it takes time to treat the conjunctivitis there so this is topical you use the dropper and put the things in on your anterior eye now there is intraocular internal challenges like age related macular degeneration diabetic retinopathy so what you do is you take a syringe and put it in the posterior eye inside you inject inside it goes like couple of millimeters inside the eye and you inject it then there is a periocular uh, thing like in the retina you can put some uh, injection there on the outer side of the posterior eye and then there is a systemic so systemic suppose you inject the drug here the only 10% will reach to the eye posterior eye because the circulation is enormous you have 5 liters of liquid so very little will go into the blood circulation but there is a possibility of reaching these arteries through the systemic circulation giving the injection so pericular is glaucoma and retinal vein occlusion this is pericular where you can inject in between the pretty, uh, retina and finally systemic is cytomegalovirus retinitis so if you have a cytomegalovirus infection then you have to use systemic antibiotic treatment and part of it goes but it takes time to treat that and these are some of the ways these drugs are used for this so now this is you have to learn this this is very important the distance between the posterior eye two ends is only 24 millimeters very small inside the eye and then if you look at this length of it it is like 23 25 millimeters so it is only 24 by 24 millimeters area for absorption so if you put the drug here the drug will get absorbed in this area because this is epithelium and this is only 24 millimeters by 24 millimeters very small area to absorb uh, and this is your lens and then you inject inside so subchoroidal injection subretinal injection intravitreal injection subconjunctivital injection these are all various types of injections which the ophthalmologist give and it is very scary even if you see the doctor injecting you feel scared because now <laughs> but they do it well if they are trained to do that when i used to work with a physician who was ophthalmologist i used to go and see the patients how they inject it it initially it was very scary but later then and people don't like it nobody will like to get your injection in your eye so the purpose of my research work was to do injections which can retain and release the drug for longer time so that you don't have to go every week and take the injection but once in a month is a big achievement if that happens in the sub uh, using nanoparticular drug delivery system so present drug delivery system for eye challenges faced in treating the eye if you look at my slide i am putting learning objectives there you know normally i don't know how you are teaching things here but in our case if I teach in the classroom I have to put learning objective so suppose my class has six learning objectives then I have to divide my slides with a learning objective there and then my question paper will have to be based on learning objective so there is a relationship between each PowerPoint presentation slide learning objective and question in the question paper and that is how they try to make sure didactic teaching that's what the American system we try to do that uh, you are doing the same thing like that here share the learning objectives for every class yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. We, your first slide is learning objective what you are going to learn and then every slide is related with learning objective it depends on the okay but is it now related to the question paper uh, the methodology changes from one to one. Okay. So, so because in our case, my student can walk in my office mm -hmm. and tell that this question is related to what learning objective. Mm -hmm. And if I cannot prove that it was within the system, then they I have to give him points. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you have to be very yeah. uh, cautious while doing this. That's why I put this learning objective just to understand how the teaching happens there. So solutions is one thing which is topical eye drop prepared with water soluble salt. You cannot put hydrophobic material in the eye because it will be dangerous. So it is always soluble salts, water soluble clear liquid. If your 
eye drops has something suspending you should not use it that is written on the labels of the eye drop then there are micro suspension these are used to drug not easily soluble steroid anti inflammatory agent and improve stability bioavailability and efficacy then you use ointments which are mineral oil plat- petrolatum vehicles for antibiotics sulfonamide because they want to stay in the eye for a longer time the drugs and then you have inserts so there are inserts which you can put it in the eye and the insert will deliver the drug over the period of longer time it's a very small insert remains in your eye under the eye lid and then there are implants surgically implanted in vitreous to release drug over 5 to 8 months you can put minor surgery and then put the implant there so these are the commonly used things now present drug delivery system so specific challenges for ocular drug administration is poor drug bioavailability because it's small area the eyes leave the tears lot of tears so half of the things are gone away so poor bioavailability the drug is not available for therapeutic action instability of the dissolved drugs that is another thing because eye carries lot of enzymes there are enzymes in the eye and the enzymes can degrade the drug it is very interesting now people are studying about what kind of enzymes and how they degrade the drug and all those things and then there is uh, another thing is limitation of the patient because not all patients are ready to take injections inside the eye they will not they don't want it they are scared of it and that is irritation is another challenge for the patient because they if you take anything in the eye it irritates like you are riding your motor bike mm-hmm. and the insect goes in your eye irritates mm-hmm. you know unless you use the helmet and cover your eyes otherwise it is terrible in the nights going fast yeah mm-hmm. uh, so challenges based on route of administration are topical lacrimation barrier systemic is therapeutic concentration you never get that then periocular injection with blood ocular barriers this is another challenge and then intravitreal injections are consistent injection retinal detachment and cataract formation now when you are doing intravitreal there is a possibility that if the injection doesn't is not given properly then retina get detached and if retina get detached that becomes a big problem so that is where you need a very specialized training for injecting this thing so why utilize nano biomaterials now this is a, why it is good in ophthalmic drug delivery system is that it optimizes the delivery of ocular drug first thing second thing is it enhances the corneal penetration it can go inside because of the very fine particles then prolong contact time with ocular tissue that is because of the uh, stickiness of the nano particle it reduces irritation of patient because irritation happens when you have bigger particles if you have very small particle then irritation doesn't happen and that is where the nano particles can be very helpful then it has sol uh, solubility issues resolve because because of the su- enormous surface area of nano particle the absorption is more better and the solubility issues can be easily resolved and then overcome poor bioavailability of the drug because absorption is higher decrease dosing because you don't have to put same amount of drug if in nano particle because there is higher bioavailability diminish toxicity it reduces lot of toxicity of the drug and then resistance to clearance and degradation and increases treatment efficacy so these are some of the advantages of using nano bio material for the nano drug delivery system and it is a very growing area Uh, if you come to america very few uh, labs work there lot of money is available for this research work so you will find nano bio material based on drug delivery systems that these are nano suspensions these are polymeric gels where the blue and red particles of the drugs incorporated into the polymeric gels then here you have inserts you know these inserts can be uh, done and then implants can be put inside the eye and that's how the present scenario is going on now commonly used synthetic polymer biopolymer for the research work are polyethylene glycol polylactic acid polylactic glycolic acid and polycaprolactone now why you use this because these are approved by the fda if you use any new polymer the paper will not be accepted if you want to publish it second thing is that if you create a product the fda will not approve it so you need to use both thing which are useful which are approved by the fda and which are good biocompatible biodegradable these are all biocompatible biodegradable so there is a pathway defined how they 
degrade in the body and how they are compatible with the body so these are commonly used synthetic biopolymers which are widely available and you can make combinations of them like polyethylene glycol is hydrophilic in nature polylactic coglac plga is hydrophilic in nature but polycaprolactone is hydrophobic in nature so you they call it co block polymers so you combine polyethylene glycol with polycaprolactone based on what type of drug you want to deliver and then if it is hydrophobic or hydrophilic and based on how long you want the drug to be released sustained release in that scenario you can use the combinations of these polymers so hydrophilic polymer hydrophobic polymer combined together to form a block co polymer they call it so it is p peg pcl peg pcl polyethylene glycol poly uh, caprolactone polymer will be a block, block co polymer and there are several of them and lot of people are doing uh, you get you know polymer chemistry has grown in last 10 15 years so significantly that you get new and newer polymers to deal with this so nanoparticles are liposomes are there you have different types of nanoparticle dendrimers we have seen this picture in many times you know so easy administration via injection because if you want to inject in the eye you need very fine particles and it is very easy to deliver it smaller particles are tolerated you know if you want to have a bigger needle do you like to have it in your eye no no <laughs> no not no. at all so the smaller the particle smaller the needle mm -hmm. and then you use micro needles now so if you use micro needles there are now the drug delivery systems which are called micro needle based drug delivery system so they are needles they attach to your skin and the drug is released over a period of time you don't even feel that the needles are on your skin because they are micro needles very fine needles but gradually they release the nano particles same thing with the eye you don't want to be a needle to go into eye your eye you will be blind so you nano particle become very useful to them so smaller particle tolerated better in eye and sustained drug delivery you know control that i have shown you earlier so at 6 hours majority of nano particle localized at retinal pigment cells rpe cells they call it retinal pigment cells are common in your body uh, eye then cytoplasmic concentrations of nanoparticles remain elevated at far as 4 months so once you inject the nanoparticle they can remain there for 4 months and less than 200 nanometers can be localized in retinal pigment epithelial cell rpe cell they call it so you can do nowadays rpe cells are readily available so you can study how your nanoparticle get into the rpe cell in vivo you don't have to do it in animal experiments also cytotoxic studies you can do it so rp cells normally they are used in the system so now we come down to the personalized medicine so a promising therapeutic approach for a wide range of genetic disorders it is now understanding you know we are understanding now more and more about the etiology of the disease we are understanding more and more about why the disease happens what is really responsible is it only in early days most of the diseases which were treated were bacterial either they are bacterial diseases viral diseases fungal infections so infectious diseases is one thing but chronic diseases is another thing and that is where the learning is happening that certain diseases happen because of the genetic thing certain diseases normally happen which are coming from generation to generation so if my mother is diabetic i am diabetic it's very simple so obviously the diseases which are occurring now they are coming from generation to generation has to be transferred from the mother or parents bodies to the child body and that is a genetic transformation so now people are understanding that genes which we receive from our parents build up our body and then also tell us that by the time you are 50 years old you are going to be diabetic or you will have heart attack or you may have breast cancer it is very common nowadays that people are understanding this that the diseases are not simply infectious but they are all genetic also and if they are genetic then if normally they say that if your grandmother or grandfather is diabetic second generation get diabetes invariably it is becoming common now if a lady is suffering from breast cancer if your grandmother has suffered now we don't have the data for it before 50 years but nowadays we have data for 50 60 years 
so generations from one generation to second generation to third generation at least in third generation there is a possibility of having breast cancer that is what they are saying now so cancer is becoming now they are trying to understand how genetics works in the cancer and people are trying to learn it so personalized medicine is in the form of rna interference uh, is a promising therapeutic approach for a wide range of genetic disorders so there are several genetic disorders which glaucoma is genetic disorder mm-hmm. so you are trying to understand how it works and utilization of small interfering rna uh, that is si rna molecules and a naturally occurring rna i path interference pathway leading to homology dependent degradation of a particular messenger rna and specific gene d down regulation has shown great potential in the treatment so now we are trying to understand if there is a messenger mrna so the mrna will tell you which part of the gene is causing the reason uh, this is and in case of now this is your dna now if you find this particular portion which is causing the disease you remove it you clip it and that's where you can treat the system and that is where this si rna uh, small interfering rna can be helpful and this is the uh, it's still in experimentation there are for cancer they have developed lot of immunotherapy but it is not in the regular practice it is still investigational drug um, application so they are now utilizing this uh, rna treatments or genetic treatments into cancer on large scale then in the cardiovascular diseases neurodegenerative diseases inflammatory conditions viral infection and ocular disease now in the case of covid viral infections we used mrna vaccines which are the messenger rna vaccine which was in liposomes so it was the typical genetic formulation which we used as gen- covid vaccine which are the mrna vaccine and ocular diseases will focus today on the ocular diseases and therapeutic targeting in the silent and advances in non viral srna delivery will look at it how the things are changing in uh, recent day so global prevalence of ocular diseases as we have mentioned that 2.2 billion people have near or distant vision impairment 1 billion almost half of this like 20% of the people have uh, ophthalmic problems with 7 mil- billion people of the world so 1 billion people include those with moderate or severe distant vision impairment blindness due to un- undressed refractive error cataract age related macular degeneration diabetic retinopathy glaucoma these are all numbers which are growing uh, day by day and that is what the global prevalence of ocular disease is there and that is where we have to uh, we are trying to find out the solutions for all these challenges so you will find this is a typical picture of how the drug is injected in the eye or oh, you remove your glasses eh? <laughs> she removed the glasses not to see that <laughs> <laughs> and the <a> joke <laughs> so you can just see that they they put the eyelids up with the clamp and then inject it and this is common thing uh, because of the gray hair you might think that i am there but i am not this is not my picture <laughs> so although i tissues are accessible by injection a non invasive topical drug administration is considered preferred so 90% of the people you ask them do you want a injection in your eye they say no 90% maybe 99% so there are very few people but if if you are going to become blind then they say okay take it that's how this uh, acceptable and once you get first injection then you realize that no it's not that bad it like you know when you give a baby injection the moment the baby sees the syringe they start crying loudly a lot of old people also cry but then once you take the injection then now you gradually you know like a diabetic patient they prick the finger correct first time you prick the finger you you are scared but then you do it 10 times then you are not scared you know that it's not that hurtful it the is. same thing happens with the eye injection also so non invasive topical drug administration is considered preferable as a frequent patient friendly treatment but non invasive is that for posterior anterior eye if you put nanoparticle they will go off because they will not stay there for a longer time and that is the challenge so invasive routes of administration can be associated with complications such as intraocular infection 
pain, discomfort to the patient, and poor patient compliance. Now there is a challenge. You know, I will explain you in our research work. We used to inject the drug into the eye of a mice, and when you inject twenty mice to create macular degeneration, ten will create cataract, and ten will create macular degeneration, and some nothing. So it is very challenging to create a good animal model for macular degeneration, and that's why the and even the animals will resist. It's not easy to inject inside the eye of a uh, um, animal, also. So the challenges of the ocular drug delivery, uh, especially the genetic challenges to the human being, are the intrinsic physical barriers, efficient drug clearance of mechanism, and complexities of ocular tissues. A significant challenge to ocular nucleic acid delivery. You know, the, it is very little research has been done on ocular tissue. We have done lot of. Uh, data is available on your stomach tissue and body skin and everything but ocular tissue is very small amount of tissue is very small so it is very difficult to get enough material mm-hmm. to do research work <laughs> so you have to kill 100 animals to mm-hmm. get a small amount of cell and that is where the challenge is understanding or uh, scientific data is not available for this thing nucleic acid is a polymeric macromolecule Made up of repeated units of monomeric nucleotide. So now this is something you call it DNA, but DNA is nothing but a uh, all amino acids are connected with each other, and it's a long chain. So as the chain b- become bigger and bigger nucleotides, then it is become a bigger molecule. As it become bigger molecule, it is very difficult to get through the RPE cell. Retin- Retina cells mm-hmm. through the that, and then that is the challenge with this. Thing. And gene therapy represents an ideal strategy for treatment of diseases of cornea. So rather than using nucleotides, the bigger chains, you go to smaller chains like siRNA, and siRNA is like thirteen to fifteen amino acids, or maybe thirteen maximum. So they are small molecules, easy to penetrate through, and easy to manage, and that is why. Uh, all the corneal diseases they are trying to use this uh, siRNA uh, treatment system so challenges of ocular delivery as we have discussed most of the stuff but you can look at this detail so each of them have different different surfaces behave differently in eye and their resistance is different it, even though it is a small area but the they behave differently and every barrier has a different property and that is why it is challenging to create something which is so ocular surface is one of the most complex biological barriers of drug delivery due to the combined effect of short contact time presence of tear film and poor permeability of the cornea these are some of the challenges uh, which are um, for the ocular drug delivery so challenges of ocular drug delivery is one of the greater challenges to topical treatment of eye disorders is the structure of the cornea the cornea itself is very tough not easy to push the drug through it and which is adopted to form an effective barrier against the fluid loss and pathogen penetration so you know your eyes are very open to the environment so the infection can be very possible easily you know the infections of the ears nose and eyes are the thing and mouth and so these are the four five openings where infections can occur and this is where eyes are made by the god in such a way that they are one of the strongest because eyes are the thing which are very useful to us for whole of our life even if you don't hear doesn't matter but if you don't see it it become big disability and that is why god has created a great strength in the eyes and that's why it is tough to put drug delivery system <laughs> you know so god did not god was not pharmacist so he didn't understand how to <laughs> deliver the drug in the eye so he made the eyes very strong the highly organized multilayered corneal epithelium disconnected by intracellular flight oh, connected by intracellular flight junction and hydra hydrophilic trauma which lies underneath make the transport of drug into and across it very difficult so this is the challenge of the structure of the eye itself doesn't allow you alternative absorption through the conjunctive ear a uh, vital pathway considered non productive due to high vascularization of the conjunctiva and because of the systemic circulation removes uh, what happens in the cells 
the vascular structure, the cells are so strong that they will not let anything go inside. Even though you inject it, the cell, the drug will remain there because of the vascular structure. That's very strong. It's like blood-brain barrier. That is what blood-brain barrier is. That the barrier is created in such a way that nothing enters into the brain. If the things start entering in the brain, people will die very quickly. That's why it is preventive system. Same thing is with the eye. So, uh, looking at the gene therapy now, uh, concept of the gene therapy considered as a form of treatment in the Journal of Science that was published in 1972. So, people had a conceptual development that genes can be used. People understood what are genes and all the things, so they thought using that. And in 1984, Dr. Gordon Vihar publishes a paper reporting successfully factor 8 cloning. Then in 1990, first gene therapy trial in humans. Then 1999, lessons learned regarding risk related to potential of severe immune responses in early gene therapy trial in non-adeno associated virus vector. So we'll see how, what are the vectors which are used to deliver things. And then human genome was completed in 2003 by NIH. And then China approved the first gene therapy for the treatment of head and neck cancers. Mm. So that is how in 2003 it has happened. First gene therapy trial in hemophilia B starts using AAV vector technology in 2005. In 15, first gene therapy trial in hemophilia A using AAV adenovirus, you know, vector technology. First gene therapy for genetic disease that causes blindness is approved in the United States. And then future is additional gene therapies are being researched and going on. So I have a very good example I want to share with you. I have a friend. This friend uh, was the head of the department of neonatology. He was the physician himself. He had three R01 grants which is like a multi-million dollar uh, mm. grants. Very brilliant guy. But out of blue suddenly suffered from lymphoma, the cancer of lymphatic system. And there was no medicine for him. So people were predicting that he will be dying in six months to one year time. It was so serious. Now it so happened that he got a job in John Hopkins. And he moved to John Hopkins uh, as a professor and head of the department there in neonatology. And John Hopkins is an, one of the best place for immunotherapy. So he volunteered himself for immunotherapy and for the lymphatic cancer. And believe it or not, I know him for six years, six, seven years since he has suffered from cancer. Now he became head of the department in Alabama and his cancer cured because of the immunotherapy. So what they did was the gene which was causing the cancer they found out a portion of the amino acid chain which was causing this and they clipped it. And then they put that clipped genes into his system and they multiplied and they multiplied in such a way that the cancer causing genes were removed. So at, as on today, he is still alive mm. and he is uh, teaching. He does all the research work. He, if you, see neonatology is one of the very prominent he is the editor of the neonatology journal also but this immunotherapy is now helping people and especially for cancer patients it is working very well and they are now trying to identify this gene therapy for different types of chronic diseases so in 10-15 years now I was talking about transformation of healthcare this is going to change the healthcare because if you can clip the genes you and stop the disease growing in your body, you are done. You can live longer. You can be 100 years or 150 years now. <laughs> but it will create more problems later. <laughs> but that is the, but it is a great uh, thing. So, siRNA functions and mechanisms and barriers and platforms are, so these are all different types of RNAs. Uh, you know, they have a hairpin RNA, they have a DS RNA, siRNA duplex, they have formation of R RIC, siRNA, mRNA coupling and then sliced mRNA. So these are different types of technologies which are now being developed for treatment. So taking a DNA and putting it smaller and smaller and creating RNA and coming. So siRNA small interfering RNA structure mechanical function this is there. So siRNA is a double stranded RNA molecule. Mm -hmm. 
which is small interfering ribonucleic acid rna is ribonucleic acid and srna contains 20 to 25 nucleotides non coding rna that regulate genes srna is produced from a viral double stranded rna dsrna so here we have a picture of dsrna somewhere and uh, yeah this is dsrna and from dsrna you can get to your srna structure and then srna causes specific post transcriptional gene silencing so you can silence the gene you either remove the uh, amino acid chains and silence it so it is not moving now it is not multiplying and if it is not multiplying then tumor will not be growing and that's how the cancer can be controlled so this process begins with rna inducing silencing complex risc this is your picture of this and then allowing the for gene expression to occur by cleaving the mrna to code targeted gene so now you are you are targeting a specific part of the gene which causes cancer you eliminate it and then it doesn't multiply as it doesn't multiply cancer doesn't grow that the technology so mrna is a type of rna found in cells and mrna molecules carry the genetic information needed to make proteins and they carry the information from the dna in the nucleus to cell and cytoplasm where proteins are made so mrna is something which is part of our body now we receive these things from our parents you know the genetic trans uh, transfer from our parents is what is this is which is transferred and then it grows in our body when we are in fetus you receive the genes and then gradually you grow and once you are out then the genes you, they those become your genes mm -hmm. and then gradually they grow and this is where this uh, um, uh, genetic diseases are now they are trying to learn those genetic diseases so srna functions and mechanisms and barriers and platforms are so srna you know every per scientist come up with a uh, different diagrammatic picture of the srna <laughs> so you will find different diagrammatic picture because you cannot see the srna so they imagine the pictures and they published in the paper so this is so this is your uh, trna rrna mrna srna and alp hairpin rna so it look like a hairpin that's why they call it hairpin rna yeah. so srna is a factor of rna pathway a cellular mechanism that inhibit gene expression in targeting and neutralizing mrna molecules which cause the protein formation so you can control that growth of particular protein causing the uh, cancer or medicines use rna interference rnai to silence or turn off the production of specific genes that cause the disease so rna interfere rnai will silence or turn off the gene formation you cut this either slice it or stop the growth of genes and that will contribute to the cause of disease that contribute to disease and rna is a natural biological process that regulate gene expression interfering with messenger rna which carries the dna instruction for making new protein so your dna is giving instruction to the mrna to create proteins and those proteins will be part of your whole structure causing the diseases also inflammation and all those things and rna i pathway is found to be suppression of desired genes functions can aid in many genome functions and can include rna stability chromosome segregation transcription translation chromatin structure which are can be useful in tra treating various diseases at genetic level and this is the uh, experimental thing which is going on exactly which mechanism will work we don't know as on today but in another 10 years you will know a lot about uh, this gene therapy so srna function mechanism barriers and platforms uh, the the process includes rna induced silencing complex rs risc allowing the gene expression to occur cleavaging the mrna to code targeted genes srna associated with risc unwinds itself to become a single strand and then this will allow srna to be scanned and analyze through risc and to find complementary mrna sequences so you will try to find out how srna can club with mrna and control the protein production and that's where the key is so srna mrna pairing leads to the enzymatic cleavage and degradation of mrna molecules as soon as you start degrading the mrna molecule because of the cleavage between srna and mrna the protein formation stops and then the expansion of tumor doesn't happen and then this is a one specific way to engineer a pathway or get rid of a specific gene in the body and then that that will be 
curing the disease or help in curing the disease or controlling the disease. So biological functions of srna are still being researched due to the wide range of therapeutic uses varying from gene silencing, defense of viral infection, gene expression, autoimmune disorders like retinal degeneration. These are all experimental we are going on. But we have seen in COVID that the mRNA vaccine prevented the multiplication of COVID virus. And we have seen that the people who received mRNA vaccine, which is genetic, uh, genetically modified system, that mRNA vaccine could control the growth of mRNA virus in the body. And that's why people did not show the symptoms or did not die after the vaccine. That is what how it is working. So SRNA delivered now SRNA delivery platforms are there. So you can use a viral platform or non-viral platform. So viral platforms are mostly viral uh, vector gene therapies show great promise. You use viruses to carry like mRNA viruses. mRNA virus itself can carry the SRNA and that's how you are using it. That's why I said probably yesterday or day before yesterday that without blinking our eyes we gave our DNA samples to the company. Now they can use the, your DNA samples to create all these problems. They can be problematic or they can be helpful. And this is where this genetic thing is interesting to see. I don't know how in 10 years we might see humanity wiped off. If this can be used to wipe off humanity. Because when the, as we have seen in COVID virus, I, I remember you must have seen the pictures in COVID virus. The COVID virus started in Wuhan, correct? Mm. Wuhan in China. But it did not reach Beijing. Beijing had no COVID infections. Wuhan is only three hours away from Beijing. Shanghai, which is the largest city in China, they had no COVID. But where the COVID went, the Wuhan people, when they traveled to Italy, and they went to the northern Italy, they worked in the companies there, the virus started spreading. From Italy, people came to United States in New York. So we had a big COVID in New York. From New York, Italian people have a high concentration in Broward County in Florida. So we have largest number of people died in Broward County. Now you imagine how the virus was traveling. From Wuhan, it did not go to Beijing or Shanghai. It went to Italy, Italy to New York, New York, Lord country. And then it spread in Europe and many different countries. So this is how these viruses can be created and they can be targeted specifically. So non-viral vectors, gene therapy shows the great pro promise and the full extent and their clinical impact is in long term, we don't know. It is still experimental. Success depends on innovative solutions that remain under development like adenoviral vector and retroviral delivery system. These are the two uh, viral delivery systems which are used in the experimental drug delivery of the things. So non-viral biopolymers, people are trying to use dendrimers as we have seen dendrimers so many times. Chitosan, liposomal drug delivery system, cell penetrating peptide, these are non-viral. They are trying to use SRNA incorporated into this system and see if it works or viral. Uh, so SRNA delivery platforms are viral vector. The past year revealed both successes and setbacks of viral vector gen therapy. Rapid development of large scale rollout of multiple adenovirus vector vaccines represented an unprecedented achievement that is poised to help mitigate the devastating impact of COVID-19 pandemic. This is where this uh, adenovirus was used. So we were, uh, this M mRNA uh, vaccine was uh, incorporated into adenoviral and then put it in liposome and given to us, which was a very small quantity. You know, you got like very few milliliters, uh, milli, 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 mm, very uh, micro liters of vaccine was necessary because it was all nano. Because it was nano, even microliters spread on, on your body and would help you in that. So during the same period, multiple high profile gene therapy assets encountered challenges with clinical trials paused because safety concerns and failing to meet efficacy targets. There are several companies which are exclusively working on this. 
using viral carriers for gene therapy and they are trying to find out how it can be utilized. So this is a caption which showed you how srna delivery can be done and destruction of cancer cell due to pei aav uh, vlp srna drug delivery and this is the whole process of creating a srna based uh, drug delivery system using adenoviral system for cancer treatment and it is still going on so viral vectors are gene therapies use modified viruses such as drug delivery vehicle to introduce specific dna sequences encoding genes regulatory RNAs or small interfering RNAs, SRNAs and other therapeutic substances into the cell. So when you put this thing in the carrier, this cells, this SIRNA drug delivery nanoparticle will get into your cells and then they start multiplying. How the COVID multiplied. Um, mRNA virus it was a COVID virus. It went into your cells. It was a dead virus. It was not live. But as soon as it enters in your cell, it multiplies. The same thing can be used for a good aspect that SIRNA viral carrier can be used in your body to multiply as SIRNA will multiply in the cell it will couple with mRNA and then you can do the gene slicing and prevent the growth of cancer cells and that is how the whole process works. The technology has long drawn interest for its potential advantages over traditional modalities and many types of uh, therapeutic agents like enzymes, antibodies, SIRNA, because like in dendrimer, if you want to take it tar now targeted drug delivery, so you don't want this SRNA delivery to be going everywhere. So it has to go into the cancer cells. So you will have antibodies attached and send it to specific cancer cells so that they can stop the growth of the cancer cells. And that is where the dendrimers can attach the antibody, take it to the cancer cell and eliminate the or stop the growth of the cancer cell. So viruses are a powerful delivery vehicle for these sequences because of their ability to enter cells efficiently and potentially gain access to hard to reach highly specific cell systems. So your cancer tumor has a strong cell system inside. So something has to go inside those cells, change the genetic structure of those cells and stop the growth of the cancer cells and that's how you uh, reduce the growth of the tumors subsequently and people have done a lot of experiments in animals to show there are a lot of papers show that this again this does happen the size of the tumor over the period of time becomes smaller and smaller so srna delivered by two major delivery for platforms one is viral vectors in combining these features viral vector gene therapy can be used to modify gene expression in a programmable way you can program it what section of the gene you want to clip you can program it and the particular amino acid sequence can be eliminated if you program it properly because that programming happens when the srna is attached to mrna and at that time you can program that which srna will work with mrna to clip the genes in the cancer cells and this is programmable and including rare magnetic uh, monogenic diseases by gene replacement and broad population diseases by controlling gene expression help disease prevention by immunization. Nearly all gene therapies currently available use one of the three vectors, adeno associated viruses, vectors, adenovirus vectors and lentivirus vectors. These are the three areas. They are using three different types of virus systems to try to deliver the immunotherapy. So adenovirus, uh, adenovirus vectors are typically used in gene therapy that are directly administered to the patient by infusion or local administration in vivo and AAV being the most popular vector for areas outside the oncology and vaccine. So this is adeno associated virus is now they are experimenting for cardiovascular for ophthalmic for different diseases but adenovirus is widely used for the cancer treatments. Now these are these are the products which are not available in the pharmacy right out the corner. These are available only in a very specialized environment and under the supervision of experts who are doing all these things. This is all investigational drug. There are, there are certain immunotherapies now that are approved by the FDA. So lentivirus vectors are typically used for ex vivo therapy in which cells devastated from patient are modified in the lab before retransplantation and the article. Now what you do is in case of lentivirus, you take the cells of the human body. Suppose you have a cancer. You take the cells of the cancer, take it out from the body. Now, 
modify those cells and then re-inject into the tumor. So now what you are doing is you are activating the genes of the cells of the human being who is suffering from cancer from outside. It is then outside the body and then re-injected or replanted in the cancer tumors and then your tumor size goes down. It's a very good technology. Either you take out the cells and then modify the genes and then re-inject it or you send the siRNA mRNA messenger system into your cancer cells and modify the genes in the cancer tumor which is in body either in body or in vivo these are the two techniques they are uh, adopting for the system so siRNA delivery platform uh, are non viral biopolymers which use liposome ph sensitive lipoplex they have cationic lipid based liposome multifunctional um, nano devices stable nucleic acid lipid particles so these are all different kinds of nanoparticles using different nano polymers or body systems because most of some of these things like nucleic acid lipid particles are part of our body they are existing in our body so they are biocompatible biodegradable so you don't have to worry about it and that's how the thing one and then there are lipio lipidoids which is lipid based system chitosan cyclodextrin peptides hybrid non volatile so these are some of the non viral biopolymers which are used for high efficiency, biocompatible, non-immunogenic and non-toxic. Now you have to understand that when you inject anything, if it is immunogenic, then your body will show a lot of re reaction. Yeah. And then you will have more problems than resolving the problem. That, that's where the immunogenicity becomes an important aspect of it. So SIRNA delivery platforms are normally cellular uptake. You have this delivery system. It goes into the epithelium, it gets into the cell structure. Once it comes into the cell structure, then it will work with endosomal escapes or translate itself and then get into transcription, nuclear important, finally get into the nucleus and change the gene structure. So this is a, again, this is a diagrammatic system. Nobody knows exactly is it happening or not. But people are visualizing that this is the way it must be happening and they try to find out the biomarkers which may help us to understand. So in the transgenic protein cell, you know, you have cell penetrating peptide, cell surface receptor, microtubule, mRNA, antibodies, particles and plasmid DNA. So these are some of the systems which are used to target siRNA into the delivery. So siRNA platform for ocular diseases or ocular disease disorders where siRNA treatments are explored are age related macular degeneration is becoming a very focused area for siRNA treatment. They are trying to find out how siRNA can improve the macular degeneration. Then in diabetic retinopathy, retinal angiogenic diseases, vascular endothelial growth factor, VAGIF related diseases. You know as soon as you, uh, what they have found out is that uh, and I will discuss that in my ophthalmic drug delivery because VAGIF is a biomarker. If you start suffering from macular degeneration, VAGIF concentration goes up and then you start facing the macular degeneration challenges. So if you reduce the VAGIF concentration, you can reduce the macular degeneration effects. So that is the interesting thing we have shown it in our uh, work that is new, new vascularization. Diabetic macular edema, Bravo branch retinal vein and occlusion and Cravo central retinal vein occlusion. So these are some of the diseases. These are not occurring in many people, but these are diseases where they are trying to find out siRNA application and if can. So current gene therapy and clinical trials for retinal degenerations are most clinical trials for gene therapy in inherited retinal degeneration are in phase one or phase two test trials. So they are not in the market yet for optim uh, ophthalmic application. Uh, because of the possible toxicity and adverse effect. We don't know exactly whether it will really work or it will not work or it will attack another genes creating a new disease in the body. You never know. And that is where the experiments are going on and they are gathering preliminary data for the efficacy. A comparison of clinical trials uh, applying viral versus non-viral vectors clearly show that non-viral gene therapy vectors are still far behind their viral counterparts. So viral vectors are more useful than the non-viral vectors, effectiveness. And the efforts are in non-viral DNA compaction methods are intensified and people are trying to use non-viral because they are safer as compared to the viral because viral can be modified. 
so they want to try to see that non viral will work out but today the viral vectors work much efficiently than the non viral ones so delivery strategies for non viral genes are you know you have uh, intravitreal injections you can do it or sub retinal injections or supra choroidal injections so these are various technologies they are trying to use it so it is either topical administration intravenous injection periocular injection intravitreal injection sub retinal injection or supra choroidal injection so these are some of the uh, injections or routes of administration they are using for uh, rna srna so since the development of liposomes in 1980 I told you that I have worked with a very interesting person in 1988. Brenda Raymond was the lady who really in 1980 created liposome first time. She was in Charing Cross Hospital in London, and then his tool postdoc was Gregory Gregory Davis. I had a luck to work with him in my early part of my research. So as the transfection agents and non-viral vectors have come to a long way. recent breakthroughs in particle compaction you know smaller particle surface coating and vector engineering have shown that these vectors have large potential in future of gene therapy introduction of peptide like polylysine which are more biocompatible and less toxic can be used as delivery and therapeutically relevant doses possible the advent of intravitreal injections and anti angiogenic drugs in the past decade has also led to improved surgical techniques now the ophthalmologist also are learning how to inject how efficiently all these injections it is not easy for them to so they are also learning controlling gene expressions via small interfering rna has opened the door to plethora of therapeutic possibilities with many currently in the pipelines of drug development for various ocular diseases so in another 5 to 10 years you will find all this thing in the routine use srna immunotherapy for optimal so you will find that the macular degeneration also will be reduced glaucoma will be reduced so you will have good solutions for the challenges including blindness so despite the potential of srn technology barriers to intracellular delivery significantly limit the clinical efficacy and ophthalmic application they are really trying to find out it's a learning process so and it takes time to understand that Synthetic nano carriers have demonstrated their suitability as a customizable multifunctional platform like dendrimers for the targeted intracellular delivery of srna and other hydrophilic and hydrophobic drugs in the ocular application so people are using dendrimers attaching srna attaching ligands attaching antibody and going to a particular area of the uh, at a, a disease disease system it is predicted that systemic nano carriers will simultaneously increase drug viability while reducing side effects and need for repeated intraocular injection the target is it may not cure macular degeneration but at least it will control macular degeneration and it will reduce the injections even if it is reduced if suppose in place of taking the injection twice a week if you get a injection once in 3 months is it good that is what is the target for the scientists to build that sustainable thing so i had i have been working in this area of thermic drug delivery i have published eight research papers in very good journals uh, edited two books on nano biomaterials for ophthalmic drug delivery and drug delivery for the retina and posterior segment of retina um, this i had done you know this is one of my colleague his name is jagat jagat kumar and i had received a fellowship which is called uh, very interesting fellowship for from australia they call executive endeavor fellowship so they provide you money to go to australia stay there for 3 months they provide you apartment everything and you do research so i had done some research with uh, jagat kanwar for srna delivery in australia i it in dekin uh, dekin university in geelong so we have we have now my patents have grown now we have six patents in this area uh, ophthalmic drug delivery i am waiting to become a millionaire if somebody <laughs> buys my patent <laughs> but i don't know so nano bio materials of ophthalmic drug delivery now uh, she is my student kaushal divya so we have published at least four or five papers with her uh, and she now she used to be in john hopkins now she will go to harvard medical school uh, very soon because she is focused to become ophthalmologist you know i i want because most of you are under graduates uh, i had a friend his son was focused to be ophthalmologist when he was in 8th grade 
So I introduced him to my friend who was ophthalmologist. So he went and talked to the doctor. He said that I want to work with you. She said, well, what kind of work you will do? He said, I will sweep your floors, but I will just, I will sweep the floors of ophthalmologist. I am not going to sweep the floor of internal medicine or pediatrician because I want to be ophthalmologist. And that kid became ophthalmologist at the end. Now he is practicing in Arizona. But I always tell his example, you know, focus. Once you have a focus, this is what I want mm -hmm. to do. Then you have to pursue it. You know, it may rain heavily, but if you pursue, you reach. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's what happened yesterday. We were, we wanted to go to see part of the Columbia and then we started and it was so pouring badly that we, oh my God. But I said, no, 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 let us wait. We'll make it. So whenever you do higher education, suppose you want to do masters or you want to do PhD. If you do PhD after two years, you feel like, what the hell I'm doing? Why the hell I'm doing? I should quit. Now, after two years, you may feel like that because sometimes you start doing experiment and it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. But then, that is the moment when you have to perseverance. You have to continue. If you continue in six months, you'll find that it worked and you complete your PhD. If you live at that point, you'll never get PhD. So, you have to have patience, and you have to have perseverance and you have to have a strong mind to, I am going to achieve. I am not going to live halfway. If I live halfway, I am going to lose. Then I don't want to live halfway. And you make it. So we have good um, publication on recent trends in nanotherapy of SIRNA to the eye, EC ophthalmology, and then this is another uh, Manjiri Sharma Kataki and Vibhuti Bhushan Kataki was my postdoc. So we wrote another good uh, article on nano platform for delivery of SIRNA to the eye, current pharmaceutical design. And then collaborative efforts, we have several people who have been working uh, in our group for this ophthalmic drug delivery. For seven, eight years we have been working. So Dr. Young W. Lee is an associate professor in Virginia Tech. Uh, Aviram Parola used to be a uh, vice provost in NYU in Shanghai. I went to, he's from Israel. I have very close association with Israel for research. Ilana Nathan is from Israel. And I'm going to talk about that in my next talk on ophthalmic drug delivery, how I collaborated with them. Charles Bruce, Anjali Hirani is my graduate student who completed her PhD and now she works for uh, a patent office in United States. Very smart girl. Dr. Aditya Grover was the undergrad who started working with me. He finished his MD, finished his residency. Now he's practicing. Very smart kid. Uh, Dr. Anastasia Grasso was also undergrad, started in lab, but then finished her master, finished his MD, and now she works with Moffitt Cancer Research Center. Then uh, Jay Shah, A. Shah, these are all, Dr. M. S. Kataki is also, they, they, are, they were my postdocs. Melinia Jameson is now in medical school. So most of Om Solonki is in medical school, third year. Kathleen Halas completed her master's in nanotechnology. She works for a company. She is a scientific writer for them. Sharon Kelly completed her master's in nanotechnology and works with USF. So all these students, they were, they started as undergrad, worked in the lab, became master, became PhD or some got into MD because of the research work and it helped them a lot in their publication. Mm -hmm. And that's what I do for a lot of students. So that's why I have so many publications. Muchas gracias. I made it before 11.30. It's 11.28, sharp. I wanted to make it before 11.28. If I finish a class sometimes, I will explain you I, I, what, how I teach my students how to write the articles. I will explain that sometimes. Yeah, it will be interesting. Not for you, but the kids. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Even for me. <laughs> Not for so you. we have time for some questions. I have a question. Uh, um, when you say, for example, that uh, uh, small interferon RNA works for silencing certain genes, how how we how we can program? I I, I, I don't know. If you I, ask in Spanish. I have no problem. I think that the, the question the is, is the same. How do we have. program the small interferon RNA? Uh, for it to silence a specific gene, like 
how do we target it? Because I understand the mechanism, but I don't know how in a level from the world. To you know, gene is a standard structure, mm -hmm. correct? Now, each of those portions of that gene are responsible for certain actions. So, in such scenario, if you can identify which portion causes multiplication of cancerous genes or which portion doesn't cause the multiplication of cancerous genes, correct? Now, what you do is you pick up a siRNA, a portion of the gene and try to understand how to clip that portion so that it will not multiply. In order to do that, you put a siRNA molecule, attach it with mRNA, messenger RNA. Now in this system, if this system, and you have to do a lot of experiments to do that, and you find out what can be clipped. If it can be clipped with this adjustment at arrangement of mRNA and siRNA, then when they multiply, the mRNA, when they multiply to form new genes, they will have a removal of that gene or silencing of that portion of the gene. That amino acids are not active in that system. And then you will do it. It is very hard to explain because it happens. But as on today, it's hard to explain in terms of how you will do that. But they do by experiment. Yeah, I get it. But I understand the slicing of the, of the mRNA, but I don't, I don't know if we have to, for example, create the sequence of the siRNA or, or how? You create the sequence of siRNA initially. Okay. Okay. And what you have to do is, if your sequence of siRNA can help, if you understand that now it is helping in preventing the multiplication of a particular gene in the system, then that we you will be using. You will not use every siRNA program. Okay. So you have to find out and then for that purpose, that's why they have two different ways of doing it lot of learning happens when you take out the cancer cells from the body and treat them outside. When you treat them outside, you try to learn how the siRNA, mRNA clip clipping can help to silence the gene. So that is done outside. So you do in many, they will have hundreds of cavities and they pour all these things and then they will use different concentrations of siRNA, mRNA clipping. Now, you will find that in 10 of those cavities or uh, systems, the genes are not multiplying. That means it is working. In 90, it, you may not see that. So, you don't have to use that. But in 10, if they are doing it, then you try to do in the cells to find out whether their multiplication happens or not with this particular sRNA, mRNA combination. And then you try to inject in the body later. So, both ways they... But Lot of learning is going on outside in vivo to understand exactly how it works, the genes. Thank you. Nice question. I appreciate that. She appears to be smart. So you come to America for studies. <laughs> if you don't like America, then go to Europe. <laughs> if you, and if you really want to do, there is a, I am very uh, confident now that if you go to India, you will learn a lot. There are a lot of good institutions now. I just got a PAD thesis today. From I am going to evaluate that PAD thesis. And I will tell you the title of the thesis. This is in India, which is a National Institute of Pharmaceutical Research. And uh, I have to read that thesis and give my comment to them. But... Uh, Oh, where is that? Yeah, Pallab Patacharya. So it's a very good research work they are doing there. So another country now, uh, there are a lot of research opportunities in China. China is doing phenomenal good work. So nanographene biofuse implant for post-surgical adjuvant therapy of cancer. This is the thesis of a PhD student from uh, India. But I, uh, China has phenomenally good facilities. I have gone to China several times. China has a national pharmaceutical university which has got 40,000 students. It's a huge uh, and one of the state of the art facilities are there. So China is a good place to go. Europe is some of the European countries have good facilities for genetic. India has good facilities for 
and america does have but not in all universities yeah so it's a great place to work i like uh, i worked in australia it was a good place to work but for you i don't know you love to learn the language and but uh, some of these countries are highly family oriented so you'll be very comfortable in these countries okay uh, any question in the the audience in the audience in the chat we have the tenemos el micrófono abierto pueden hacer la pregunta hablada o escrita i will have some questions in the chat that's the only things okay no no further questions uh, i had a question but her question of course was uh, <laughs> more interesting but yeah. my because i'm not in the area so I know, yeah. uh, as i can It's see them, it is, yeah. I, i would like to to know how a cure is that procedure or take uh, the, uh, the the gene treatment to to clip some uh, uh, specified uh, uh, screener and doing that uh, that you were explaining how you know the uh, uh, rate it is, uh, that's why i said that what happens is when you see the picture you see a scissor clipping <laughs> but that doesn't happen <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, psychologically you feel like there is a caesar and you clip the amino acid it is not that way it happens what happens is that if there are the sequence of amino acids and if you break the sequence and you one of the amino acid is inactivated and the last point of amino acid is inactivated now the, there is no connection between this amino acid and they don't work with the rest of the dna molecule or rest of the gene molecule and that is where that clipping happens so deactivating amino acids can be done with various ways and that's the technology what they use is that if a portion of the uh, you know i so this is how that amino acid thing look like you know i am not very good in drawing but like that is it there now this portion of the dna strand we want to clip and we find out that this is causing the multiplication of cancer genes so what you do is here there is now this is not so here you try to deactivate this and deactivate this now this portion does not interact with each rest of the portion by because of the deactivation once it is deactivated you are in other words silencing deactivation is nothing but silencing the portion and one this cannot communicate with this portion and this cannot communicate with the rest of the portion so you have silenced it so it doesn't talk mm -hmm. when it doesn't talk i am just joking mm -hmm. when the, it doesn't interact once it doesn't interact then it doesn't allow you to multiply the uh, gene which is causing cancer and that is called silencing or deactivation of the amino acids which are extreme part of that section if they are not de uh, deactivated then this will portion keep on multiplying and your tumor will grow if they are deactivated then the genes which are growing further this portion will not happen so the rest of the gene will go grow this portion will not be doing that is deactivation of the and you use different types of systems to deactivate the amino acid there the amino acid the amino acid that it makes sense it's, it's how you know like it's not the gene expression which is silenced yeah okay. because once you deactivate the expression will be different yeah it's uh, and once the, the expression is like multiplying and that expression is you identify the new system which doesn't cause multiplication of the cancer cells that's how you control that it's very interesting but uh, sometimes i i many a times i feel when the people show the diagrammatic system sometimes it is helpful sometimes it misleads 
because they put a scissor there like in one of the <laughs> and now if you are not in that area then you think oh what kind of scissor <laughs> they will use here? so how I mean, fine <laughs> how fine is it it's not scissor which is working it is the deactivation of the molecules that particular amino acid deactivated deactivated means they don't multiply you know any cell normally in human body our cells multiply and every 7 days 10 days we are you know rebirth birth and rebirth is a continuous process uh, i am a hindu i believe in birth and rebirth mm -hmm. because in our day to day life our birth and rebirth is continuously happening because every cell dies mm -hmm. and then new cell comes so on a cellular level birth and rebirth happens 24 by 7 in our body it is a very natural process of dying because you know in my philosophy we say that the only thing which is certain is li in life is death is death rest nothing is certain <laughs> you can get phd you may not get phd you can get masters you may not get masters get all is uncertain you find a good boyfriend and then you dump him <laughs> normal so <laughs> am i right or wrong <laughs> <laughs> right or wrong? Not right. <laughs> <laughs> so it is a but certain is death. The moment you are dead, you are dead. And the same cells which protect you, which multiply, which die, but they don't smell. But once you are dead, your body starts smelling within four or five hours. It decomposes so fast. that you can't even stand next to the body unless it is frozen and protected so this is the spirit which exists in our body mm -hmm. and this is the birth and rebirth so it is a very natural process death same thing happens with cancer cells cancer cells have a ability to multiply and they are in many cases it is a normal process because normal cells also multiply cancer cells also multiply but the cancer cells can kill you normal cells give you life this is the only difference so this clipping of the genes will stop the multiplication of cancer cell so that you can survive a little longer doesn't mean that cancer cells will never grow it is simply a technology but the death time comes even if they don't grow you die <laughs> okay there is a portal question in the chat when gene therapy is performed the gene is edited But is there the possibility that it, it absolutely it does we don't know that's why there is a risk in gene therapy but there is a calculated risk so you have genes you try to modify edit it and use it as a drug and there is a calculated so people are using this in the last stages of cancer certain things where they are confident they are trying to use it in the early stages of cancer also so based on the risk they uh, normally you give in writing like we gave in writing for covid mm -hmm. that we will not sue pfizer in america we did that we gave in writing that we know this is a investigational vaccine and will not sue the pfizer that's how pfizer is lucky otherwise mm -hmm. now pfizer would have been bankrupt there are so many cases people are asking for compensation so the same thing happens with that the investigational drug they give in writing that i am at the fourth stage of cancer i i don't mind taking it and it works if it works he is living longer if it doesn't work you know certainty of death is there mm -hmm. so it is it is a you know it, it's a matter of time it's a learning process which is going on and you will learn more and more and more it like any other drug which were developed in the olden days same thing happens with gene therapy okay which has gracias let's thanks the professor again thank you very much my i appreciate that i hope you are enjoying what i'm saying i i am sure that it has <laughs> eh muchas gracias a los que están en línea nos vemos mañana a las 10 en punto una feliz tarde Great.